And our next guest uh, has done a lot of work exposing that. You know, I want to cover the waterfront with him today. You can disagree with some of their solutions. And, you know, the, 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 the Washington Post has called them extremely right wing. Other media has called them Marxist. Uh, I really think the best way to describe them is complex. And, and, and I want to get Jeff Steinberg's own view on themselves, but we had Lennon LaRouge on last week, so not, why not have Jeff Steinberg on this week? He's been the director of counterintelligence for News Weekly Magazine, EIR, found him at Lennon LaRouge in 77. He's an investigative journalist with 30, uh, with uh, t uh, over 25 years. Steinberg has written and presented lectures on subjects ranging from who runs the international dope and weapons cartels. And over the years, I've just found out their analysis is spot on. Who, uh, to whom is behind the cover-up of Princess Diana's murder, and most recently, who authored 9-11. He also has an in-depth knowledge of the cover-up of President John F. Kennedy's assassination. I want to talk about all of this. And developed extensive knowledge on the inner workings of the Justice Department, FBI, and DEA. In recent years, Steinberg has directed a number of special investigative projects for EIR, resulting in a series of uh, feature packages on subjects such as the coming fall of the House of Windsor, uh, would President Bob Dole, uh, well, it just goes on from there, uh, over some of his famous treatises. He broke down the big name Brzezinski on September 11th, LaRouchePack.com or uh, LaRouchePub.com are the websites. And I want to cover the waterfront here uh, with Jeffrey Steinberg. But Jeff, first, uh, in 2002, as you know, over a thousand pages of IMF World Bank documents got released the week after Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stiglitz left. He says he didn't release them, wink, wink. And Greg Powell put them out, of course. And in there, they admit the 100-point-plus plan was 112 points of how they go in, buy off politicians, get them in debt, have them sign over the nation's real estate, and infrastructure, then the corrupt dictator leaves, they implode the country, cause rioting, bring in austerity, which causes more rioting, more austerity, uh, selling off the infrastructure, the country never gets out of debt, it's all fraudulent. But that now they were going to do it to the first world nations, and now they've done it. And admittedly, most of the debt in Iceland, uh, in um, Ireland, in Greece in Portugal is not owed by the people. On record, in most cases, over 90%, some it's down in the low 80s, is, is owed in Ponzi schemes in derivatives, as you know, the banksters created, the big six megabanks, with the Queen of England and the Netherlands and the Rothschilds and Rockefellers sitting high atop it openly. And how, how, how painful is it for you to know this for 30 plus years, to speak about it, write about it, to now watching it all come to a head as they globally conquer everyone out of their fraud, out of their Ponzi schemes, calling for a bank of the world to pay our carbon and VAT taxes to, and to see them implode countries, literally shut off the social services, toilet paper in government buildings in New York, you know, all of this knowing that it's a black hole of debt designed to reduce us to absolute slaves. And now it's in the news today. Financial Times of London, you name it. It's up at DrudgeReport.com, Infowars.com as well. It's all up there today where they say, oh, guess what? We need another bailout now or Europe will collapse. And then you give them another bailout and then it'll collapse and another and another and another. And the same threats we saw here three years ago when Henry Paulson threatened martial law, they did the same thing in Europe. Tanks in the streets, blood, martial law. Jeffrey Steinberg, what what is going on here? Where when is this going to end? It's going to end when the Ponzi scheme is burst, when an alternative policy is put in place, and uh, I think that we're a lot closer to accomplishing that, particularly here in the United States, than a lot of people think. Look, you put. You, you put the fundamental issue on the table. For decades and decades, uh, we cataloged and documented the absolute genocidal looting of the developing sector, whether it's Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, exactly what you said, creating a debt bubble, going for asset stripping, depriving the countries of their basic livelihood, resulting in massive population reduction all on their agenda. Now they're trying to do it in the first world. They're trying to do it in Europe, and of course they're trying to do it 
here in the United States with the policies that really began with when, uh, particularly when Greenspan came in as chairman of the Fed and on behalf of J.P. Morgan broke up the whole Glass-Steagall system that had hamstrung the banks from looting the savings of households and wiping out any kind of credit for investment in the real economy. So now we're at the point where in the House of Representatives, you have a Glass-Steagall reinstatement bill before the legislature. It's H.R. 1489. It's got about 20 co-sponsors now. And our perspective is to overwhelm the White House by having the majority of members of the House of Representatives co-sponsoring the bill to where people like Barney Frank can't dodge the bullet and prevent it from coming up to a debate and vote on the floor of the House. Same thing in the Senate. We're expecting any day now a Senate version pretty much identical to the captor bill. This is a flank to bankrupt Wall Street. This is not just simply a way of reconstituting commercial banking. Like a chargeback of an unauthorized charge on your credit card, we're going to charge back at least $17 trillion in gambling debt accrued by the big Wall Street banks and by some of their European friends, particularly in the inter-alpha group of Lord Jacob Rothschild. Jeffrey, the stop bank. right there because I want you to get into Rothschild and all that in more detail, but I don't want to just glaze over the important things you're, you're saying. They admit that customer service banks, lending banks, uh, uh, private sector banks are disappearing. They're being gobbled up by the regulators run by the big six banks who put their people in to all the main positions of power. They admit that the customer service level of banks and actual lending for the economy is shutting down all over the world despite them being flush with banker bailouts uh, mm -hmm. and, and that they're laying people off at banks everywhere. I mean, this is a planned implosion. This is, this is economic genocide. That's exactly right. And we're going to make sure that it doesn't succeed. And that's the fight that we're in right now. You've got a mood in the country where there is an absolute sense of betrayal by this president, by Wall Street. And we've been at public meetings all over the United States. The 4th of July recess was a perfect opportunity. The Progressive Caucus had a series of policy forums. We were in Milwaukee and Detroit and Harlem and New York City. And when our people got up, our candidates in particular, and raised the issue of Glass-Steagall and bankrupting Wall Street and reconstituting the viable commercial banks that are needed to protect depositors' savings, to issue credits into the real Tell economy. us what the people did when you said that when we come back. Jeff Steinberg's our guest. Going back to Jeffrey Steinberg. Uh, I want to get into a host of other issues to really look at who these people are, but you were getting up to the point of speeches all over the country with your organization, and when you talked about Glass-Steagall, going after the banksters, the response you got. It was electric. Uh, standing ovation, and uh, in, all, in, in all three instances that I'm referring to, there were several members of Congress on the podium who were co-sponsors, uh, including in one instance, Marcy Kaptur herself. And there were other members of Congress who had not yet signed on. And universally, every one of them, when they saw the reaction, said, count me in, I'm on board. And we're holding their feet to the fire. We're going to see what happens by the middle of this week. We expect to see all of those people now on as uh, signatories. Uh, we're going for the jugular against Wall Street at a moment when they are most vulnerable. They're hated by the American people. The bailout is despised. Geithner is in there knowing that another trillion dollar bailout is going to be needed to save the big six before the end of this year. And there's no political way that that's going to be tolerated in Europe. You've got literally nonstop rioting in the streets of Athens because people are just completely fed up with the sellout of their government and the fact that Maastricht and the Lisbon Treaty is a banker's dictatorship straitjacket on them. This is not going to go down in Europe, but in particular in the United States, 
We have a history, we have a constitution, and we have a remedy for solving this problem. We're going to basically take that $17 trillion in bailout money and charge it back to the brokerage houses and insurance companies and reestablish a full wall of separation so that commercial banks do what they're supposed to do. Take deposits and issue loans to businesses, home loans for mortgages, and let these gamblers basically choke to death on their own bad debt. Well, what is their end game plan? We've seen what they've done in the third world, but attempting this in the West, they've gotten away with it so far while imploding society. I mean, all the indicators, all the data is coming in on the, on the societal you know, uh, meters and control panel here. Uh, you know, the instrumentation shows we are in, in a serious crisis, and they really think they're just going to run implosion after implosion, looting and stripping after stripping with more looting on top, selling us that they're the good guys. And anybody that criticizes the private Federal Reserve is some type of terrorist. That's not going to hold water. I mean, more and more, the human cry is get out the guillotines. That's right. Remember the attitude of uh, Percy Shelley. He said, we are many, they are few. He was talking about the oligarchy, and it's absolutely true at this moment. They, they selected Obama as their instrument. Uh, they uh, intend to try to go for some sort of pretext for dictatorship, uh, but the odds of them succeeding are very slim. The real key question is not whether or not there's going to be a revolt. There is a revolt already, and it's going to get much, much louder and much nastier. The question is, will there be an alternative policy or will the anger spill over into just uncontrolled chaos, in which case their agenda, as you mentioned earlier, of massive population reduction is what's going to happen? That's the key question is, is there leadership? Is there a policy to bring about an economic recovery to basically cast off this completely illegal parasitical gambling debt from the backs of average citizens? And will we go back to a credit system based on commercial banking, federal credit to be issued through the private banking system for viable projects to create jobs and rebuild our economy, starting with basic infrastructure? But then Those meanwhile, the, the banksters have, uh, fund a lot of phony libertarian groups, and I see myself as a real constitutionalist slash libertarian, but I don't like labels. You know, they're too simplistic. But meanwhile, they finance all this, quote, free market stuff that, oh, you can't finance any public works projects because that's socialism. Well, what is it when you give tens of trillions to offshore banks that don't pay taxes? I mean, I'm against socialism. But, I mean, if you're going to have you know, government projects, then it should be the people. But then I get back to if we're going to have bailout money or we're going to print money, at least issue it to small businesses. How about that? How about just have lending? How about the currency be controlled by the government and the Congress as it's supposed to, as the founder said? Stay there, uh, going Jeff. back to Jeff Steinberg, you know, I want to shift gears now out of what's happening economically after we cover one more quadrant, because I got, you know, I'm, I want to pick your brain on so much more dealing with their agenda. I remember 15, 16 years ago when I was already on air, folks mailing me, executive intelligence review and uh, i'd already done a lot of research and it and, and and found your analysis to be accurate but 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 even going deeper and now 16 years later i know that it's even worse than you guys even report this is so off the chart where they admit in published books and documents that the health care is to deny you care and train you and kill you and, oh, you don't need glasses or eye surgery. How about a cane? Or we're not going to treat that brain tumor. Or we're not going to, I mean, th this is, and then they, they, they cloak it and call it liberal. Then they have fake Republicans like Mitt Romney endorsing carbon taxes and global warming and who wrote the health care bill in Massachusetts as the model. And it shows how they control both parties. It, what is their global goal if they're not stopped? What will they do? What is their exit strategy from command destruction, from a post-industrial world as Maurice Strong and the head of NASA Space Center, uh, Goddard Center says, uh, Al Gore, Ted Turner, uh, just a few months ago in, in, in Cancun, Mexico, saying one-child policy, global tyranny, endorsing infanticide. I mean, 
People expect Hitler with a mustache on. That's that, that was in the 30s and 40s, folks. It's shown up different this time. And because it masquerades with a lisping NPR affectation, people go, well, you're whispering at me. I'm just going to lay, lay down and you can run over me. Who are these people? What is their end game? What's going to happen in Europe now? They're, they're gearing up for obviously a giant new war as a smokescreen. This is insanity. Well, look, the, take it from the top. Uh, just take a look at the British Royal Concert. Prince Philip, who's one of the founders of the World Wildlife Fund back in 1960, 61, uh, he just says it outright. Reduce world's population by 80%. Uh, there's a top economic advisor to uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, named Schellenhuber, who basically... Uh, spreads the whole global warming lie and says that the world population, the carrying capacity, is actually uh, reaching the point where it's under one billion people. These people reject the most fundamental thing about what it means to be a human being, which is creativity, the ability for scientific discovery to improve the universe. And so for them, they have a utopian fantasy that they can go back to some kind of postmodernist form of feudalism where somehow or other the world population is reduced by 80 percent by wars, disease, and famine, and somehow or other they will remain unaffected. Bertrand Russell uh, wrote in 1953 that uh, if we could perfect the method for having a black death once every generation, uh, and we could determine who lives and who dies in that process, then we would have the kind of world that would be safe and happy place for oligarchs like him. Um, these people ought to go back and read Boccaccio, the Decameron, which was Boccaccio's account of the delusions of the oligarchy in Europe at the time of the 14th century Black Plague, where they also thought that somehow, by bloodline, they were immune to what was going on all around them. And they're not. So. There's no question that they are doomed. The question is whether or not the rest of mankind is going to go down with them. That's right. Or whether we're going to put together an alternative policy. That's right. The social engineers, the Anglo-American eugenics proto-Nazis, I wouldn't call them neo because they, Hitler, of course, was an extension of that openly funded by projects. the, absolutely, openly funded by the Rockefellers who fund uh, Bono now. And, of course, Bill Gates, uh, uh, I mean, he, he's an open subsidiary of the Gates Foundation. He doesn't pay taxes, but goes around telling you that middle class and have its taxes raised. I mean, these people are nightmares of evil. And I'm glad folks are rioting in Europe whenever uh, uh, Mono, excuse me, Bono shows up. But there's something on top of this, Jeff, this, this, this uh, transhumanism. And I don't mean all the flavors of it, but the dominant one coined by Aldous Huxley's Brother Julian Huxley, when he wrote in 1951, Hitler has just, and you can pull this up, folks, Hitler's discredited eugenics because he went too far too fast. We're going to rename it transhumanism and promise that all of this tyranny and genetic engineering and the rest of it will extend life and, ma and make us transform. So they sell their takeover uh, and... They sell, and, and the elite sell the public going back to nature, but really they're delusional. Uh, as you know, it's being pushed everywhere now uh, in the transcendent man and the rest of it, that, that they're going to live forever. Here's the Daily Mail today. Dawn of a new age. The first person to reach 150 is already alive and soon will live to be a thousand claims scientist. Dr. Aubrey de Grey and then you've got uh, you know, all the rest of these people pushing this. So at the highest level councils of the globalist system, this is what they're obsessed with. Whether it's real or not, they think, like some Ian Fleming book, Moonraker, they're going to kill all of us and then, and then inherit the earth and go up on some Mount Olympus and live forever like Zardoz. I mean, these people are nuts. Uh, please talk about it. That, that's exactly right. Uh, they are nuts. They have delusions, but I think it's more important to realize that basically uh, this is the essence of the oligarchical system. It's the essence of the system of money power based empire. You could trace it back 
uh, to Rome and even to earlier antecedents, uh, you had a phase in which Rome morphed into the Byzantine Empire and then into Venice, and Venice relocated to the Netherlands and to England. Uh, what you have is a system that says that there's an oligarchy at the top uh, that rules through the power of money and that uh, the rest of humanity uh, is basically to live in some kind of form of animal or slave existence. So it's that system that has now reached another one of those breakpoints where the Ponzi scheme has burst and where they are desperately scrambling for a way out of it. You said a few moments ago that, uh, that under these kinds of circumstances, they go for war and they go for dictatorship. That's exactly right. We've entered into a new fiscal year as of just a few days ago on July 1st in 47 out of 50 states. Uh, all of the states collectively are bankrupt to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. And in order to basically conform to the Constitution and basically uh, solve that indebtedness for the start of the new fiscal year, they've implemented levels of genocidal austerity. And now on top of that, you've got this whole silly debate over the debt ceiling uh, in which they're using it as an excuse for further slashing medical care, all kinds of things. The American people are looking for an alternative. And we have the alternative clearly in hand. It's before the House. Uh, we also know that to achieve the change in policy that's urgently needed at this time, President Obama needs to be removed from office through perfectly legal constitutional means. It's a scandal in my mind that the House of Representatives has not already convened the equivalent of a grand jury into the president's failure to meet the requirements of Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution in this ongoing Libya operation. Uh, it's a clear violation, not just of the War Powers Act, but of the most fundamental issue within the Constitution, namely the fact that we were not to be a monarchy. Kings were not to have the authority to frivolously go to war. It was given to the Congress precisely because we wanted to make it as difficult as possible to get involved in wars. President Obama believes that under the doctrine of humanitarian intervention, which in UN lingo is now called R2P, responsibility to protect, that he can bypass and rip up the Constitution. That is intolerable. Well, Jeff, and we can see control. the new model of, of 1984 tyranny where they call war peace and, and go around slaughtering everybody. And that's the reason they gave him the peace prize, knowing that this was the strategic uh, blueprint. It, it's all part of the sick joke, rebranding war as peace. Precisely. So now we've got a situation where uh, many people in the Congress know that the president is in clear violation of the Constitution. So we have an avenue prescribed by the Founding Fathers for removing a president from office if they've committed high crimes and misdemeanors. And there's no doubt that President Obama crossed that threshold. We also have the option of Section 4 of the 25th Amendment, which was enacted in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination which laid out precisely how a president may be removed from office with a checks and balances system if he's considered both physically and or mentally unfit to continue to serve. The president's crossed that threshold also. And again, these are issues that are not going to be fought out strictly inside the beltway because there's a great paucity of members of Congress with the moral guts to act to defend the Constitution. We have a group of 10 members of the House, uh, led by people like Dennis Kucinich, Walter Jones, John Conyers, and other, who filed a federal suit against President Obama uh, for failing to live up to his constitutional obligations. And so the federal court now has this matter before them. And this is what caused the White House to completely freak out and scramble 
to cover for Obama's flagrant violation of the Constitution. Well, even Nadler, and, and, and of course Ron Paul, but even Nadler, the minion of Obama, right. uh, came out and said, if this stands, the presidency is now a king. I mean, he used the term emperor, and, and, and folks don't understand, this is one of the most pure forms of tyranny. If you go back to crossing the Rubicon with Caesar, uh, and right. whatever it was, 45, 46, I forget, uh, uh, before Christ. In fact, we guys pull up Caesar's crossing on the Rubicon for me. Thanks. I, I forget the exact year. But the point is, is that uh, this is so out in the open and so ridiculous. And his lie that it would last days, not weeks. And now the special forces are there. They're preparing the ground troops. The Russians have confirmed. Uh, what the Israelis have confirmed, that what we first reported a month ago, that it's on, cold-bloodedly, always knowing that if they couldn't get rid of Gaddafi, they'd go to ground force, and calling it humanitarian. Now, the, the, the corporatist empire, a very dangerous new strategy, and I'd like you to talk to this, now all they have to do is foment some rebels in the Middle East, North Africa, it's Al-Qaeda as usual, same folks they use against the Russians and the Serbs, have Al-Qaeda blow up some police stations, shoot some people, government fights back against it, and then there's a full-on invasion, and you don't even call it a war, and our media now tells us we must support Al-Qaeda. Well, look, let's, let's be very clear, though. The Constitution, the War Powers Act, the debate that went on around the passage of the Constitution was very clear. Only the Congress has the authority to declare war. And if you go back to the early history of our republic and when, we're, when we were battling the Barbary pirates, um, Justice John Marshall of the Supreme Court was very clear that Congress lays down very precisely what the president as commander in chief can and cannot do. And the minute that the president crosses the line and goes beyond that, uh, he slapped down in order to cease and desist. Now, under even just the war powers resolution itself it specifies not only american troop involvement but if an american commander is involved in a military operation then that constitutes a requirement of the president to get congressional approval who is the commander-in-chief of nato it's admiral stavridis who's an american naval four-star um, the AfricaCom came out with a report last week that basically proved that the president was in contempt of Congress when he filed a 32-page memo arguing why he didn't have to come to Congress. For the, the first time, they've and ignored, said, for the first time, Jeff, as you know, three weeks ago, right. they ignored the Pentagon's own lawyers that said, you got to go to Congress. That's right. And this past week, AFRICOM came out and said that U.S. planes with U.S. pilots have carried out over 800 bombing sorties in Libya since the beginning of hostilities, and that at least 160 of those resulted in bombs being dropped on targets. Uh, one of the members of uh, the uh, Senate during the early debate last week uh, was grilling the State Department General Counsel, Harold Coe, who's one of the big George Soros men proposing this humanitarian interventionist doctrine. And uh, one of the senators said, well, by your definition, we could drop an atomic bomb on Tripoli, and as long as no American soldiers are in danger, that doesn't count as a war. So it's preposterous, and Obama should be being impeached today, the first order of business, with the reconvening of the House tomorrow afternoon, ought to be canceling all other business and convening the House as a grand jury to consider the impeachment of Obama. You're absolutely. That, and that's a serious message that the Congress is listening to the American people and that we want a radical change in policy back to our traditions. Well, if we don't, the sky is the limit, and more and more uh, Obama wants to use troops domestically and the TSA against the American people. Jeff, we're going to break, but do you agree that we're also seeing a domestic spy apparatus and now beginning to be turned loose against the population? Absolutely, and the president would like to go for dictatorship if he can come up with a pretext to get away with it.
I want to come back and get into 9-11, false flag stage terror attacks. I want to get into Obama death care. I was getting into uh, state-sponsored terror, uh, but also because you, I've seen your reports. I've seen it myself, and they're saying it. I've read their books where they say it's for the population reduction. They're going to kill us and how the old deserve to die. And then they, they count on the public not reading all their writings. And we sit here with horror going, these people aren't liberals or conservatives. These are, these are psychopaths. Jeff Steinberg, how, how do you deal with this? Well, the first, the first thing that you've got to do is uh, shed the public light on them. Uh, a lot of the things that they say themselves, uh, they say out of the arrogant and false assumption uh, that their words are only being heard and read uh, among a very tight circle of like-minded people. So there's a great deal that's to be said for simply sticking to the intensive historical research uh, to give people a framework for understanding who these people are and what they're doing. And uh, that strengthens the population uh, to take the necessary curative action. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier Adam Smith, and I, I had a laugh to myself because you know, here was Adam Smith, supposedly the great ideologue of the free market system. But at the time uh, that he wrote, he was working for the largest cartel in the history of mankind, the British East India Company. He taught at the East India Company College, along with people like Jeremy Bentham and James Mill and others. So that is the cornerstone of the liberal ideology that's the poison that has prompted so many people in our own country to forget their responsibilities as citizens of a republic and ignore history. So, you know, warfare has always been the instrument of the oligarchy uh, as a way of keeping populations both reduced in numbers and dumbed down. And, you know, you mentioned the- Jeff, the stay there, back in one minute. Jeff, stay there. We're talking to the director of counterintelligence, uh, counter one of the chief uh, writers and researchers at uh, EIR. You can find out more at LaRouchePack.com or LaRouchePub.com. Uh, Jeffrey Steinberg, I want to briefly get your take on DSK and then a few other issues and take calls, but you were finishing up a point as we hit break. Go ahead, sir. Well, I think the point is just simply that, that, that really having an understanding, a grasp of history and understanding it from the standpoint that there's been a long-running historic fight against this oligarchical faction that permeates the whole history, particularly of Western civilization from Western Europe, the migration into the United States, into North America, was all about getting away from the stranglehold of oligarchy. And the United States, therefore, does have a unique historical mission, a unique history, and our job is to restore that because there's still a gut sense of that that uh, moves around in the minds of the American people, and you see it particularly in crisis moments like this. Well, that was my uh, next point. That was my next yeah. question for you, is we see the awakening accelerating, evidenced by just a decade ago, it took four to six years for a population to wake up to the fact that a Bill Clinton or a George W. Bush was a fraud. They woke up to Obama, the poll showed, in less than a year, and now he's the most unpopular president in modern history and, 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 and plunging. Now, when the Republicans get in with a Mitt Romney or somebody, and they don't deliver, they're going to be political uh, dog food, fish food, in a matter of weeks. And so their little tricks aren't working very well anymore, and soon aren't just going to not work, they're going to blow up in their face. And I'm seeing that on more and more fronts. And so they're desperately coming out, bashing the Constitution everywhere as if it's sexy and trendy. I mean, they're really revealing themselves, and I see it all coming uh, to a head. So what can you say, what, what can you say about that? The flip side is that you've got a small but growing group of patriots. We see it in the Congress with things like the bipartisan action to reinstate Glass-Steagall, like the bipartisan suit taken out against the president for violating the Constitution. I think that the top leadership of both of the political parties 
have shown themselves to be completely bankrupt. That's why you've got a majority of American voters considering themselves to be independent of the two parties. So what we happens when they betray us again? We have to make sure we win before that. We have a very short time fuse in which to win this Glass-Steagall fight because that's the way we put the onus back on Wall Street. We pull the plug on their Ponzi scheme and in many cases, these people ought to be being frog marched off to jail. But if we win on the Glass-Steagall fight, that will be the end for the Obama presidency and we'll see a new combination coming into being that's based on people who put country and the survival of future generations above petty partisan politics. That's what I see beginning to happen. That's what the population absolutely wants. They're responding to those politicians who change their stripes and take that position. And, you know, Mr. LaRouche has put forward very clearly the steps that have to be taken in the immediate days and weeks ahead. And I think that the vast majority of Americans are behind it. So I think All right, let's, let's talk about what happens if we don't change course and stop the Ponzi schemes because the, the system admits the Ponzi scheme is meant to gobble up all wealth on the planet. It's hundreds of times all the real wealth on the planet. They're fraud. If we sign on to it, it's like a lead weight of a trillion tons around our neck being thrown into the Marianas Trench. We'll be right back with some of your phone calls, some other key issues with Jeff Steinberg. Straight ahead, something you've well. really looked at, you've really covered and have done a sterling job. In fact, I read some of your EIRs online, some of the featured articles, not the, the thick publication itself, the quarterly or monthly, whatever it is. I um, mean, I know I get them in the mail, but never have time to read those. I read the online stuff. I saw your analysis and other people at your outfit uh, two and a half years ago when this fight was just starting with the quotes and, the, and what Dashold written in his book and what Bill Gates was saying and and how the insurance companies had written this to cut off care and, and to take control from doctors and providers away and let the HMOs you know, control it. And then I would go actually look it up or buy the book. I did a lot of research. I did some of my own as well and found not only was it true, it was even worse than you were saying because there's no way to cover it all. And now Bill Gates has come out and said, yeah, we want to kill grandma to give 10 teachers jobs, selling the false idea that if you have a, a predatory cannibalistic economy, that, that for you to have a job, somebody's got to die selling this play us off against each other economy. Can you briefly speak to what this health care monstrosity really is? Sure. Well, look, the, uh, the, the, the essence of Obamacare, aside from the overall killer austerity, uh, is the creation of literally a death panel. Uh, the uh, independent... Uh, payment advisory board is to be given life and death decision making over what medical procedures will be allowed, will be paid for, and which will be basically disallowed. This was what Hitler did in 1939. At the very outset of the Anschluss, um, Hitler created a euthanasia panel uh, at Tiergarten 4. It was the physical location in Berlin where the offices were, it's identical in every respect to what Obama has created under Berwick and others, uh, so that it's a, it's a Nazi policy. And he beta step. tested it as early as 35 with handicapped That's children right. at government orphanages, and they would send the little fake death certificate to the SS on file. That's right. In 39, they began it in earnest. They continued the policy for two years, and there was a backlash against it, even during war in Nazi Germany, and the Catholic Church, among others, pushed back, and they had to basically temporarily walk away from it, but they obviously reinstated it on a grand scale with the concentration camps, the gas chambers, all of the rest And they had the that. IBM so, machines for that, all Rockefeller involved, total scum. Right, right. but it started out with death panels. Uh, where you had a, quote, independent board of professionals who were using cost analysis to decide who lives and who dies. And that's what we, we have with Obamacare. Well, yeah, they had the IBM Hollerith machines for those death panels. That's right. 
unbelievable. And now IBM again today. For my research, have you looked into Thomas Watson, the big Nazi eugenicist, sure. and how he put a lot of IBM's money into a trust? And that's why IBM is always involved in RFID and tracking and human genome and eugenics is because literally many of these big foundations, pure mission, these people are obsessed with killing people. Well, look, you had a meeting in New York City at Rockefeller University uh, about six, eight months ago, and there was then a follow-on meeting, and the participants were Bill Gates, George Soros, Warren Buffett, and a half a dozen other multi-billionaires who pledged to put all of their, quote, philanthropic money into the most important issue, which for them was population reduction. It's all right there in black and white. So you've got this little wannabe oligarchy group who all made their money in one way or another in speculation and other dirty activity. Soros's big deal is drug legalization and laundering drug money. That's who he is on behalf of the British. So uh, it's a repeat of things that we've seen many times before in history, but now we're seeing it with the real vengeance, and we've got to just make sure these people are crushed before their plans go ahead. And by the way, at the end of the Times of London article from 2009 in May that you report on, billionaire club and bid to curb overpopulation, and at the end of this article and others, they admit it's a world government to carry out the population reduction, and then you get the Royal Commission from, from 59, 49, excuse me, that I know you've written about. They said, we, we could industrialize, and, and actually the third world wouldn't have too many children, even in their view, but instead we're gonna cut off development, let their populations explode, and then have after the fact mitigating things to kill them off, like war, famine, diet, injections, and injunctions, so they let you be born and then kill you. I mean, it's, it's these people make Jeffrey Dahmer look like Mother Teresa. That's the oligarchical system. That's the essence of it. Uh, these these people are beyond uh, evil, and, and we did put that article on screen that you mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you, you cannot make this stuff up. Truth is indeed stranger than fiction. Doug in California, you're on the air with Jeff Steinberg. Go ahead. Good morning, Jeff, Alex. Hey. Uh, I'm calling from your favorite place here in California, KSCO land in Santa Cruz. Oh, I love it. And, it, and uh, 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 I really like the connection you've been drawing between the weaponization of water and how it's been uh, you know used to control and... Uh, what I'd like to end your guest talking about Ponzi schemes, and as you might know, we have one of the biggest agricultural areas in the world here. Four and a half billion dollars, Monterey Bay, it suffers 15, you know, according to Mark Rides, the worst saltwater intrusion loss in the world through big agra's expropriation of our water supply to export our uh, water supply or steal our water. I'd like to hear your guest thoughts on how water might be used and is being used to control us. Yeah, the takeover of all commodities for artificial scarcity. Jeff Steinberg, say hi to everybody out there in KSCO land, beautiful area. If I lived in California, it'd be in Santa Cruz. Thank you so much. We want to say hi to all the listeners of KSCO, like Doris Day and, of course, the one, the only. Uh, you, uh, uh, folks, you know him uh, out there as Clint Eastwood. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, get a comment from Jeff Steinberg on that. Well, look, we've had a complete depletion of the uh, water tables in many, many parts of the country. In other areas, we're getting uh, intensive snows in the winter and rain. We need a f an effective water management system. It was designed in the 1960s by Parsons Engineering out there in California called the North American Water and Power Alliance, which would create a modern system of water capture and irrigation through dams and canals, taking about 20% of the Arctic runoff in the spring, funneling it down through the western states of the United States. Oh, but that's development. You can't have that. That, that money's got to go to Wall Street so they can fly above our slums in their jets and helicopters. And not only that, this program would create immediately somewhere in the vicinity of five to nine million productive, good paying jobs because this is the largest engineering project that's ever been undertaken in history and it can be done 
You'd create immediate jobs in over 30 states in the country. You'd have a revival of the but old Jeff, that's the American the that's the American system. We're the country that had the big projects, the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, the Panama Canal, and the French couldn't do it. That's evil. That that's the American. You know what? I want to do five more minutes with you on the other side, and we've got to let you go then. And you've been very gracious, but I want to be able to talk to Richard, Wendy, Tim, Aaron, uh, Keith, and others. But. In 30 seconds, I'm going to get one more call in. How would you describe the LaRouche organization? Washington Post calls you right wing. Other media calls you Marxist. What are you really? Small R Republican and the American system. What you, what you just said in terms of our perspective, that this is a nation that was founded on the basis of a credit system to get away from a monetary oligarchy. If you go all the way back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, we established something that had no previous history of existence on this planet, a true republic based on a credit system in which it's not a private oligarchy that governments go begging. Credit to empowers money. the individual. Credit doesn't create a monopoly for the oligarchs that issue the fraudulent uh, uh, instrument. Precisely. Precisely. All right, let's jam in one call, get their question. We'll come back and answer it. Richard in California, then Wendy in Hawaii and others. Richard, you're on the air. Go ahead. Alex, thank you for talking to me, and uh, I really uh, enjoy your guest. I have a comment and a question for Jeff. Um, Jeff, thanks for everything that you're doing. And uh, here's my comment. I, ho I hope that you'll take this very seriously, even though it sounds unusual. But no, no, make I your comment. We're going to go to break. Go ahead. Okay. The states are not broke, and they're not states, they're corporations, and they're hiding massive money using the broke charade to take us one step closer to martial law. If that could be exposed, I'm looking for... You're, you're talking about comprehensive annual financial reports and the fact that we've been induced into debt by fraud. He's saying technically... Uh, all 50 states are bankrupt within the bailout system if we sign on to the derivatives. But I'll let Jeff Steinberg answer that. Answering Richard's question, he's talking about the comprehensive annual financial reports, the double set of books, the investments of government, water districts, school districts, state governments, federal government agencies versus their budget that we know is only one area. Uh, what's your comment on that? Well, all of that's true, and of course, you know, Wall Street has been doing these uh, various uh, insurance swindles that have looted a number of states and municipalities, but the, the fundamental point is that immediately after our Constitution was ratified, the country was, for all practical purposes, in debt and bankrupt, and in an agreement that was reached between Hamilton, Washington, uh, Jefferson, Madison, who were already sort of squabbling at that point, it was agreed that the federal government would assume all of the dates of the debts of the state so that the federal government could engage in the issuance of credit, converting this debt into an instrument for credit for the development of the economy. And in return, the states would not have the ability to carry forward debt from one year into the next. There's all kinds of tricks that have been done by Wall Street to pervert this system, but the bottom line is that as of July 1st, 47 out of 50 states had to basically have a balanced budget. In other words, they had to come up with cuts Firing police, firing teachers, firing firemen, doing other things. That's the that austerity, and it's because we've agreed right. to be signed on to the derivatives fraud. So you're saying we're bankrupt when we're signed on to this Ponzi scheme. We've got to unsign from that. Wendy in Hawaii, exactly. you're on the air with Jeff Steinberg. I, hello? Yes, Wendy. Welcome to the hello. airwaves. Hello. I think I jumped the gun. I saw two headlines. I had to run out to work at 4 4 a.m. It's like 8.30 in Hawaii now. I just got home. But I think uh, somebody brought this up on your show the other day about the Australian Green Party, um, Bob Brown. The headline said, Active, um, AU Green Party leader admits global warming is really all about world government. No, no, so that's, that's official Green Party in um, Australia. They say it's an excuse to manage all human activity for world government. And we posted uh, th those reports uh, last Friday. I appreciate your call, Wendy. Uh, that's just more of this continuity of agenda, this global strategy. What is the carbon tax? Jeff Steinberg. Carbon taxes, uh, 
It's literally an attempt to create yet one more Ponzi scheme, literally out of hot air. Uh, it's an attempt to basically have a new bubble that will be explicitly a tax on any kind of modernization, any industrialization, any improvement on the conditions of life. And not surprisingly, Al Gore, through his blood and gore brokerage house in London, has tried to corner the market on the creation of this global carbon swaps futures market based out of Chicago and London. It's a complete swindle. It's based on a scientific fraud. And literally, it's an attempt to create one more Ponzi scheme to kick the can down the road of this vast financial bubble. And it's so even it more evil like because they selectively enforce it, just like Obamacare, where all the insiders, the inner coterie of the oligarchs, they don't have to pay the tax. It's incredible. That's right. Unbelievable. And, but it, it, it's not going to happen because uh, increasingly the fraud of global warming, the swindle, is becoming more and more transparently obvious. And what I'd really like to just say and urge all of your listeners, all of your viewers, is that we're in the process of winning this Glass-Steagall fight. And the more people that get in on this and get to their congressmen and hold their feet to the fire to do something that will be vitally in the interests of the entire people of the United States, this is it. And I can guarantee if we get Glass-Steagall presented before the House and the Senate for an up or down vote. Obama is doomed. Absolutely. That puts a stake in the globalist uh, heart big time. Jeff Steinberg, thank you for joining us. Look forward to speaking to you again in the future. LaRouchePack.com. Thank you. Infowars.com is our site.